where we left off with rolling essentials. So um, again, um, the um, working point that is the exit thickness of a strip and the load required uh, for the rolling um, is determined by two parameters, the, the mill stretch and the plastic curve of the material. So one is related to elastic distortion of the mill, the other one is related to the um, material response to compressive loads. So again, where do these come from? You open the mill at a certain um, uh, gap, S0, yes. Uh, as you, uh, and, and you have a material that you want to roll which has a certain entry thickness, H0, right? So on this graph, this defines these two points. As you uh, roll the material, this, the mill will stretch, yes? This stretch causes a, uh, it's, it's linear with the, um, with the, uh, with the load. Hmm? So, so as I uh, uh, intend to um, stretch the mill, yes? And, and the stretching has to be understood very broad sense, it includes bending, of the rolls, it, it includes elastic, def elastic bending, elastic deformation of the, the mill stand, yes? Um, so you get a, uh, this, this uh, roll gap will increase and, the, and there will be uh, pressure or load on, uh, exerted on the rolls. Hmm? Okay, and that goes along this line here. And there's one parameter here, which is the slope of this line related to the slope of the line. It's called S, and it's called the mill modulus. Okay, it's something you measure. Hmm? Uh, the other thing we uh, measure is the uh, material's response to the compressive loads, and that on a uh, load um, thickness uh, diagram, basically would be uh, as it were a stress strain diagram. Of course, the strain is negative, so you compress the material, strain hardens, and as you increase the load. So, and these, these are examples here. And the point where you end up is the working point, yes? And um, so you've, you like to uh, know where this point is uh, because this point will vary, will, will change due to the changing circumstances. Changing circumstances may be changes in the mill and, ch and or changes in the material. So let's have a look at uh, what happens to the plastic curve and the mill modulus as we go uh, have uh, changes in the, in, uh, in the rolling conditions. Hmm? So, uh, so this, the base, these uh, curves here are what we call the gauge meter uh, method. Gauge, again, gauge means thickness, basically. So um, it, it basically means that when you measure load changes, they are directly related to thickness changes, right? Because this point, this working point, varies along the mill stretch line, yes? Okay, so when, when you measure, uh, we'll see in a moment, in a mill you have load cells that measure this, this P value. Hmm? And uh, so when this changes, it means that your working point has moved, yes? And it's moved somewhere along this line, yes? And that also means that your thickness is changing, yes? They don't, you cannot change things, again, in the mill, very few things you can change independently. So if you change the friction, things will happen to the load, and if the load changes, the thickness will change, okay? So everything is interrelated. Uh, so there are no simplistic ways of running a strip mill or a rolling mill, right? Okay? So this very, be very careful, it's a really important message. If you're ever in a plant, yeah, don't do silly things like people say we have a problem and you say, oh, I increased the load, right? Because other things will happen, yes? 
and maybe unexpected things because you think that you can change things independently of each other, okay? So if you change the load just like that, you can be sure that you may solve a problem, yes, of, you know, some stability with the mill, but you'll also change your, your sample, your, your, your uh, product's dimensions, yes? So uh, you may be running a stable process, but then you'll make useless product, okay? So very careful, okay? Uh, and, so, and so there are a lot of refinements to this method of gauge meter, but all of them go back to this gauge meter method. Huh? So for instance, um, uh, 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 let's see what happens if uh, the strip you're getting, yes, has change, changes its thickness, yes? Hmm? For, so what happens then with this working point, yes? So when this, the, 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 uh, the changes, the, the thickness, entry uh, thickness changes, so this point simply moves to the right, yes? What happens to my working point? I, I arrive here. So two things happen is that I will suddenly see the load change in the mill and I will also, uh, and, and I will, I may not be able to measure it, but you can be sure there'll be an exit thickness change, yes? Mm -hmm. So in order to control this, yes, what do I have to do, yes? The important thing, of course, is the product, yes? The product is you need to have the constant exit thickness. So the only way you can uh, change this uh, situation is by increasing the load, yes? So how do you do this? You, well, you have to move your uh, mill stretch here to the left, okay? And what, how do you do this? Well, by decreasing the roll gap, okay? Well, you'll say, well, of course you'll do this, right? It's, it's, you get something thicker, so you need to reduce more. That's right. But the way it works is this way, right? The, you get an increase in pressure, in load also, hmm? as you do this. Okay? Because this, these are, this is an obvious situation. But let's look at other situations, yes? Okay? Um, for instance, uh, some effects in rolling. Hmm? Um, let's have a look at three interesting effects. We can look at what happens when the rolling speed changes. What happens when we change the tension in the strip? Yes. Or what happens if we change the friction? Yes. Okay. Now, um, I'll, I'll explain this later, but when you roll, yes, a, uh, in a mill, the, you would think that the gap is a constant value, yeah? Uh, well, it isn't. The, the, the gap changes. And the reason it changes is because as you go faster, yes, uh, it's maybe counterintuitive, but all the bearings in the mill, uh, which are lubricated, all the lubricant films become thicker. Yes, and so that causes a, the roll gap to decrease slightly. Yes, so it decreases slightly, and so you have an increase in the pressure, in the load, uh, in the rolling load, and a decrease in your uh, product exit thickness. Yes, now you'll say, why is this important? Well, when you're starting to roll, a, a strip or you're stopping rolling a strip, that means you have to compensate for this effect, yes? Hmm? So that as you roll faster, you need to increase the pressure, yes? So that um, uh, you, you, you keep uh, the thickness correct. You have to, excuse me, decrease the pressure so you keep the, the thickness uh, correct. And so you'll do, the way you decrease pressure is you open the, 
you open the roll gap a little bit. Yeah? These are tiny effects, but they do, you know, they are being taken care of. I mean, they're being controlled in practice. Yeah? Um, if you have strip tension, yes, strip tension is equivalent if, uh, to a reduction in the strength of the material. So the thickness is the same, but as I increase the strip thickness, yes, I see a reduction in the load, yes? And, and we know why this is. It's because the friction uh, peak decreases. Excuse me. The energy needed to deform the material decreases. That's the more correct way. Um, and, and so you see the working point changes. I get less load, also less, uh, my product thickness is changed, yes? So I will have to compensate for that, yes? So uh, I'll have to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. I want to have this uh, thickness, so I have to move this line to the right, yes? so that this becomes my working point and I achieved the thickness that I want, okay? Okay. Another, yes, is uh, the friction changes, yes? Um, in a cold uh, strip mill, that's pretty much constant. In a hot strip mill, there may be some variations, yes? So if we increase the uh, friction, it's as if we would make the material harder if you want. I get an increase in the load, I also get uh, an, an increase in the, uh, uh, so I get an increase in the thickness, right? So I have, again, to compensate for that. The way I compensate is I reduce the, the roll gap, yes? This point then moves up and I can achieve a smaller thickness again, okay? So um, the, uh, 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 measurement of the uh, load, rolling load, is very interesting way to control the thickness of strip. You don't have to come to my classes, but if you come, you're not texting. All right? Um, so, uh, nowadays, uh, it, uh, you know, it, any good mill, yes, will have measurement devices to uh, to control the exit uh, strip <laughs> thickness. Very so constantly and and within very um, uh, small um, limits. Hmm? So what what you basically have in a, a mill is uh, first of all load cells. So load cell basically measures the rolling load. That's one of the very important parameters, yes? And um, we can uh, feed this into a what's called a absolute uh, uh, automatic gauge controller, yes? Where we have some model, yes, uh, for the rolling load, yes? Nowadays also we have thickness gauges, which are reliable enough to be used in industrial conditions, yes? Um, so they're mounted typically a meter or so away from the, um, uh, the, the mill. Of course, as close to the mill as possible because you're going to use that data to feed back into the control system, right? So, um, so you measure this, yes? So uh, here you basically have the elements you want uh, to control the exit thickness, the, the, the load and the actual thickness, right? So you can um, uh, use this into a controller, which will then correct things. Yeah. So how does, how does this, is, how do you control um, this, this, uh, this pressure? Yeah. How do you control the position of the rolls? Yes. Well, so the position controller goes into a servo valve, yes? In the case, we have a so-called um, hydraulic automatic gauge control, HAGC. I'm sorry, I, I didn't... Uh, so this is HAGC, means hydraulic automatic gauge control. And uh, so that's basically a pressure cylinder, yes? 
Yes. The servo valve controls the pressure in this, uh, in this cylinder, and uh, you increase or decrease the pressure in the, in, on, the, on the rolls by means of this um, hydraulic capsule. Yes? All right. Now, there are two systems to do this. There is the, uh, the, this hydraulic automatic gauge control, which basically works with the pistons, Yes, and high, pr and oil under very high pressures. Yes, but um, but you also you can also do uh, change the load and uh, the gap setting with uh, electro uh, electromechanical ways, where you basically screw down the um, uh, the rolls. Yes, you basically screw them down. That's a much slower system. The response time is much slower. So, the, uh, uh, you can see here this, uh, so for instance, a response time to have a tenth of a millimeter change in uh, the roll gap, yes? It, uh, it takes uh, eight milliseconds for a hydraulic system to get going. It takes a few more milliseconds for a uh, electromechanical system, yes? Um, okay, so it goes much, you can see here the response times are much uh, faster. Yeah? Okay, and this is a, a picture here of a um, uh, hydraulic automatic gauge control system, yes? And uh, this one is, you can, you can have these cylinders can be mounted below, under the, the roll stack, or on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, the one here on top, uh, picture here, um, the, the top mounted hydraulic uh, system is, is nice. So you can see it's mounted on the frame of the roll, and these, uh, these um, uh, flat parts here actually exert pressure on the rolls, yes? Okay. So you, uh, if you would cut this through, yes? Um, so you have here, you have the cylinder body, yes? And here you have this piston, yes? Okay, and, and, and here you have oil, yes? And, the, and, and by increasing the oil, you can make this piston move up and down, and this uh, tr uh, trust plate, you know, this flat plate, pushes on not directly on the roll, but on what we call the roll chuck. The roll chuck is where you mount you mount the roll in. Hmm? Roll is mounted on a chuck, which is called a chuck, and so you press on this, press down on this chuck, and you you increase or you decrease the uh, pressure. Hmm? Okay. And, and so what you basically get, and, uh, you can also directly, you also measure things on this cylinder, yes? You can measure the pressure, the oil pressure directly, and you can measure the position of this, uh, of the, um, uh, of this trust plate, yes? Hmm? Okay, and then you can feed this back to uh, the setting, yes? Uh, and then you go uh, via some uh, gain controller. You can control a servo valve, yes, which basically increases or decreases the pressure inside the cylinder, which makes this cylinder move up and or down. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the case of a screw down system, mm -hmm. we, it's different. There you you basically have a, a mechanical system, mm -hmm. and you have worm gears. <laughs> yes. So here we have. You have the, the trust block, which rests on the chuck, yes? And then you have ins, uh, mounted inside the, uh, the, the, the body of the, uh, the stand, the rolling stand, you have uh, a nut, yes? A nut with um, a, a, a threaded, threaded part, and then you have a screw, that is also threaded, of course, which turns into that 
threaded part, so the, the, the screw can move up and down. And when it does move up and down, it exerts more or less pressure on this thrust uh, block. And how does it move up and down? Well, it moves via a gear, yes? So there is a gear here, yes? And this gear is basically, it's, um, it's, a, it's a toothed wheel, yes? Yes, is uh, activated by a worm gear. Also, that's a threaded bar that moves uh, in one direction or the other and can increase or decrease um, the position of this, uh, uh, this screw here. Yeah? So if, if you, three dimensions here, you see you have a motor here, yes, a motor, yes. Uh, this motor makes this uh, part move up or down, yes, and exert pressure on the, um, on the chuck here. Okay, so you see, this is, uh, for instance, a backup roll. Here you have, uh, in this particular, the load cell is mounted here, yes. This is the thrust bearing that uh, presses down on the, in this case, the load cell. This here is, you have the screw down the nut that's mounted in the, in the frame of the mill, and here is the screw down, the actual screw, yes? Moves up and down, and, and, and this is how you make it move with this electrical motor here, okay? There's a lot more to mills than just uh, exit thickness uh, control. Um, products have to be not only have the right dimensions, uh, they have to be straight. Uh, or uh, if they're strip products, we have to make sure that they're flat, yes? So we'll go into that in more detail uh, later on because that's a bit more specifically related to, to some products and we'll, we'll talk about strip properties which are very, very important. Hmm? Um, a few things um, that uh, may be of interest for the uh, next lecture is um, you know when you when you make deformations at high temperatures and you have a, a piece that's 25 centimeters in thickness and you have to turn it into something that's five millimeters in thickness you know how you know how much how long does it take yes um, well um, uh, in a, a typical uh, uh, hot strip mill, you will go through, uh, we'll see a roughing stand, and there you'll, you'll have about six to eight uh, roughing uh, uh, stages, and in the finishing rolling, you'll have about seven. Hmm? Okay, so in total, we're looking at 14, 15, deformation steps. In this uh, case um, of a hot strip mill, the temperature goes from about 1150 to uh, about 1050 in this roughing uh, rolling and from 1000 to 850 or thereabouts in the finisher. And the reduction per pass in the roughing, it's 20 to 40 percent that you give, yes. In the finishing, it can be high at the start, and it will be uh, in the lower end, can be much lower, five to 15 percent. Yeah? The strain rates are very different. In the roughing, we've got uh, two to 25, uh, typically, five, 25 being the high end. And in the finisher, it goes up to 100 the second. Yeah? Interpass times, that means how long does it take between passes in the roughing, 10 to 20 seconds. In the finisher, much shorter, hmm? three to half a second. And the reason is the, the roughing mill is a reversing mill. The finishing mill is a tandem mill. Tandem means you have, uh, you, you roll, uh, you pass the strip through different uh, uh, mill stands, okay? So it's, uh, I, I will let you have a look at this uh, uh, by your, uh, yourself, you can have a look at this, but you, you can actually 
um, you know, calculate that um, uh, that the number of reductions uh, fifteen, yes, is actually um, very reasonable and very it's to be expected. Um, so the, the um, again, um, the steel mails are uh, are based on design, right? It's it's not like uh, oh they all look like this because we've always done it like this. No, it, it's it's not like that. Yeah. Um, so the, the ways you 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 roll slabs is uh, because you have uh, schedules of rolling. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the final thickness hmm, is determined by uh, the reduction per pass, yeah, which are dependent on the entry conditions, the bite angles of my um, a strip, the type of steels that will be rolled, and the stand strength. Yes. So certain things, certain things cannot be rolled in certain uh, rolling mills because the, for instance, the, the rolling loads are, that are required are too high. Hmm? Um, so the reduction, yes, uh, that you can uh, apply, yes, in, in total, the total reduction hmm, is, is of the order of one to two. Yes, it's a total reduction. Yeah. That's very large. And think about if you're involved in um, making steels, the reduction that you give to your material is of the order of you know, maybe 10, 20%, 30%. And if you have exceptionally uh, formable material, it'll be um, you know, maybe 60%, 70% at fracture. Yeah. Okay, so in, in, in the mills, you, you know, the total uh, deformations can easily go up to uh, two, so that's 200 percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, now you cannot roll things uh, like that. You need a, a rolling schedule. So you have to do uh, reductions. Yes, are limited by the fact that you want to avoid cracks of the edges in particular, mm -hmm. and you also tend to reduce the amount of reduction you give because that allows you to improve strip quality. Yes? Strip quality. So you kind of have maximum amount, the higher amount of reduction in the intermediate passes. At the beginning you can't give large reductions because you're going to have edge cracks. At the end you want to protect the surface. Right? So you don't do much you do smaller deformations at the start and at the at the, at the end of the rolling. Yes. So um, say um, right. So if you want to calculate how much um, uh, passes you need to achieve a reduction, uh, uh, if you for total reduction, if you have uh, a mean reduction, yes. Typical mean reduction, yes. So, um, so for instance, if you do the calculation for uh, 25 centimeters to 5 millimeters, yes, uh, then you can calculate that the total reduction is the mean reduction to the power n, n being the, and these are true strains, by the way, yeah, uh, n being the, um, the number of passes. Hmm? So uh, if you say the mean reduction 1.5, then n is 10 passes. Yeah. And you can see, uh, you can assume different amounts of uh, 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 total deformation and different amounts of mean deformation. And you see that, uh, as expected, uh, you will have between 10 and 15 um, uh, steps yeah, of rolling. So this is an example here, um, actual measurements of, um, of the, um, the, the, the time of the rolling, yes, 
the thickness that you achieve and the amount of reduction. Hmm? And so for each mill in a hot strip mill, this is the reversing mill, a, an intermediate roughing mill, and then finishing mill. Hmm? And you can see that you, you get a lot of reduction, yes? Thickness reduction, yes? In the roughing mill, and much less thickness reduction in the uh, finisher. But if, yes, if you now measure the reduction, yes, the percentage in reduction, you actually see that the amount of reduction here is actually not so large, yes? yes. This will be of the order of, yes? And, and here, at the start of the finisher, you give a, a considerable amount of reduction in comparison. There's also a thing that's interesting here, is that as you uh, do the rolling, yes, yes, um, it takes uh, it takes time, yes. So do you, you know you start rolling, and then you and so so and um, so for instance here at, in the finisher. Start of rolling, end of rolling, about 100 seconds, yes, etc. So you can also see that here. And all right, so that's that's about the end. That um, so we reviewed some some things that will be useful in the uh, next section, hmm? um, <coughs> where we where we'll be looking at hot strip mill and, and how we make products there. So the, uh, the hot strip mill uh, that we'll be describing are so-called fourth, fourth generation mills. Yes, they're very common in, uh, in integrated mills. And they consist of several major parts. One is, the first part is a reheating furnace where you, you start from slabs. Then you have what we call the rough deformation, the roughing mills. You change in that step the slab to a bar, an intermediate bar. And then you go into the finisher, finisher, which is a tandem mill. Then we go into the cooling section and the coiling section. So every uh, step has its specificity, and we'll discuss that. Um, it's interesting to focus on hot strip mill because they're common. And even if you look at a bar mill or a wire mill, the structure of the hot deformation section yes, is very similar. Yes, you always have a, um, a reheating, where you reheat uh, the billets or the blooms. Yes, there's always a, a section where you do uh, relatively rough uh, shaping of the material, and then you, you finish the product to get the end size. And this is followed by very important cooling and coiling section. Yes. Uh, the cooling section is essential because that is where the transformations happen. Hmm? That you usually you roll in the um, austenitic uh, range, so FCC, and when you uh, have the product, it's low temperature. Yes, uh, it's ferritic. So in between. Yes, you can control, you're in the cooling stage, you can control the, um, right, let's do this again. Mm. 
it doesn't want to. Let's close it. Let's do this. So where is it now? Oh yeah, it does, I always forget this. <sighs> it doesn't want to open the file if you do click. All right, so um, hot strip mails. Hot strip mails, um, they will also look differently sometimes because of the type of products that are being processed. So let's uh, go through these general points here. Hot strip mill is a process where we uh, roll a slab yeah, at a temperature uh, in a state where it will go through recrystallization if it's deformed. Mm -hmm. So the steel is deformed and uh, what, we, what will happen is we change the austenite grain size mm -hmm. Um, and the end product is a semi-finished steel coil. That's already a product. There is a market for this, yes? So uh, the, the quality of this intermediate product is very important, yes? Hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the principles of these uh, mills, yes? And the designs and the instrumentation and automation systems that are important, yes? And we'll also talk about how uh, slab quality has, has an influence. Hmm? And we'll discuss all the uh, uh, features such as uh, slab reheating uh, requirements, the design of the surface of the um, reheating furnace, uh, roughing and finishing mill designs, uh, the descaling, uh, strip and width control box, coil box technologies, etc. And also talk about a little bit about the roles that we use. Okay, and then we will talk about uh, and we'll give some, some examples about uh, the impact of the processing on the quality. Uh, but we'll have a separate uh, section where we actually discuss products and how they're made in a hot strip mill. So again, uh, what does the hot refer to in hot strip mill? The recrystallization temperature. So we, everything is above 630. Yeah? Actually, uh, all the processing of, in the hot strip mill is above this temperature. Yeah? By the time we coil the product, it's very often above this temperature or around this temperature. So the recrystallization is uh, very important. And you know what this means? This means that you may deform the material, but in between the deformation steps, material recreates a low defect density, recrystallized material. In, if you work in a large steel plant, there is a, uh, because uh, these are very large plants, that it, you may get the impression that uh, hot strip mills, the clients of the hot strip mills are cold strip mills, and that's it. Yes, you, that's the only thing you have to worry about. That's actually, you know, uh, important to realize that this is not the case, yes. Um, we have the very high uh, customer demands, yes, in terms of material properties, quality, and consistency. Mm -hmm. And so the hot strip mill design, yes, is actually very much determined by what is the original product mix that the hot strip mill was supposed to supply. Hmm? So the mechanical, the electrical dimensioning, etc., uh, the automation is all determined by what kind of products you want to uh, produce. Huh? And it can be very different, yes? So to the uninitiated person, it all looks like coils, yes? But uh, you can have very different uh, uh, product mix. And this is an example here for two plants, yes. Uh, this one here has um, all kinds of constructional steels, formable carbon steel, IF steel, tube, tin plate, etc. Yes, so a large variety of um, applications. In this one here, yes, 
it's very different. We see that um, three quarters of the production is devoted to formable low carbon steels and stainless steels. Okay, so this would be a very different uh, uh, line, different uh, way of running it, etc. Okay. All right. So um, as I said, most of these um, uh, uh, lines look very similar. Yes. Um, I've um, uh, compared here three uh, hot strip mills that are in operation. It's not so important which ones they are. Um, so uh, it's always uh, important parameters in hot strip mills. You know, what kind of slabs, what's the size, what are the dimension of the slabs that you can process, yes? Um, in terms of width, thickness, and length. And you see here, for instance, hot strip mill length, maximum length, 9.6, okay? Hot strip mill uh, two is 15 meters. Hot strip mill three, uh, 12. The width is also very important, yes, because that will tell you what is the maximum width of the product that you can deliver. Yes? So this line here, hot strip mill one, 1620, yes. Hot strip mill two, two meters 20. Hot strip mill three, a little less than two meters. Yeah? So um, this uh, hot strip mill is much uh, less well equipped to uh, produce automotive uh, steels because in automotive industry, uh, they are interested in very large sheet steels. Yes, because then they can make very large stampings. Yes, yes and this is, uh, improves the productivity and the quality of uh, the, the material, hmm? the products. So, okay, uh, strip, uh, of course the width is determined by uh, the slab size here. Um, the thickness also, you can see here uh, to, uh, up to, it, when, when you look at the thickness performance of a hot strip mill, what people like to look at is how thin can you go? Okay, because that allows you to uh, sell thin hot strip band. It's, yeah. And so um, you can see here, and in general, uh, hot strip mills, the lower uh, boundary is about two millimeters. Even that will be, is difficult, yes? But you see here that um, uh, you can go down to um, 1.5, yes, 1.2, that's very low, yes, and typically 20 to 25 millimeters in thickness. Hot strip males don't like to produce thin strip because that's very, that decreases the productivity, yes, so in general, uh, it doesn't make you popular when you develop a thin hot strip product, yes. Thin hot strip products are very much ideal for uh, compact strip uh, mini mills, yes? And we'll talk about these uh, technologies next course, so in the fifth generation hot strip mills. Coil weight is also very important because it's a reflection of the productivity you can achieve, how much you can produce, yes? Uh, you see here line number two, 45 tons. So that's uh, very heavy equipment that uh, you need, for instance, when you coil materials. But the specific weight of the coils is typically uh, 20 current, for many uh, mills. 23.6 uh, is, is very high. Yeah? So that's a yeah. maximum speed of uh, processing. That's the the speed that the strip will have at the exit. This, these are very high uh, values here, and 23, we're talking about, um, I, I don't know exactly, but many kilometers per, per hour, so very fast. And the capacity, of course, as you can expect, uh, line number two uh, will have very high capacity, about four million tons of steel can be processed per year. Oh, here, no, what, 10 meters per second is 36, so 20 meters per second is, is very high very high speeds, yes? 
Now, okay. Now, it, just to give you an idea about what, what does um, 2.4 million tons per year or 3.6, how much is, what, what is that? I mean, how, uh, well, um, a, a hot strip mill, um, a good hot strip mill, high, high performance, uh, with, with, with good equipment uh, these days can make 5 million tons of strip. Yes? And if you assume that the thickness is about 4 millimeters and it's, the width is about uh, 1,340 millimeters, then this, the total strip length that's produced per year is 133,000 uh, kilometers. Yes? So uh, that means you can go around the world uh, a few times, yeah? more than three times with this strip, just from one mill. Yeah? Okay. So it's a huge amount of material hmm, that is produced. Okay. Um, when we talk about these fourth generation mills, the original designs are not that old. The uh, original designs in the 80s, yes. Uh, they, they actually are... Um, very good way of producing steels uh, in terms of cost. Uh, usually they will have, we'll see, a reversing rougher, yes. Um, they will be, they will, they will be equipped with, we'll see that again, with walking beam furnaces. Mm. They will have heavy edging. Heavy edging allows you to reduce the width of your slab. Yes, and so it allows you to change, to have a variety of uh, product widths with the same caster size. Yeah? And then um, there is a lot of um, automatic control. Yes, there's a, modern mills have uh, hydraulic automatic gauge control. There is uh, roll bending, roll shifting, and cross pair technology. We'll see that in, uh, later on. This, these are just technologies that allow you to control the profile, the flatness of your strip. And then we will also see that uh, there are technologies which are developed and installed to get the temperature homogeneity in your material uh, perfect, almost perfect, and, and one of these technologies is the coil box. Yeah? Okay. So again, um, just in case uh, you you find the our focus on hot strip mill uh, a, a little bit too uh, overwhelming. So continuous hot strip mills make out uh, probably half of the hot strip mills that, that we have in the world, yes? And there are still, um, of course, there are things like mini mills, and we will talk about this, because this is a fast growing segment of mills. Um, and um, we will uh, we'll discuss this, okay? So just in a, uh, a bird's view of a, a fourth generation mill, uh, starts after you have your slabs you know, that come from the continuous caster. These slabs are usually st stored, yes, for processing. You know, this, the slabs here, that's where this, the steel plant ends, yes. Okay, these slabs are allowed to cool, yes, and then they're, uh, they're processed in a specific way, which again we will discuss later, yeah. Uh, and they're uh, then taken into the uh, reheating furnace, yes. They are rolled here in a reversing mill. Mm -hmm. There may be a, here this intermediate coil box. Mm -hmm. And then they are rolled in the hot, uh, the finishing mill, the tandem mill here. The, uh, between the, the finisher and the, Coiling, it's not shown here. There is a um, a um, cooling section. Yeah, okay. But what you get after uh, this process is are these coils here, and you can see them uh, if you compare them, for instance, to the same coils 
after they've been cold rolled, yes, you can see they're black. Often they're called black coils, yes, because of that. So they're hot rolled coils um, here in this, in storage. Okay, so we'll be talking about that part of the uh, the processing and the the part that comes afterwards, the pickling, the cold rolling, the annealing, and maybe the coating. Hmm, we'll talk about uh, which which leads to. Uh, flat rolled, uh, cold rolled products we'll, we'll discuss in a separate section. Okay? So some useful uh, vocabulary when we start because in the field people uh, you know, have their own vocabulary to uh, describe the parts of the um, hot strip mill. So a slab, you already know what this is, yes? Uh, it's a rectangular uh, piece of steel, like 20 25 centimeter thick, more than a meter in width, and about 10 meters in length. A bar is what happens to, is the name you give to the slab after it's passed through the rougher, yes? In, um, and uh, the roughing is such that uh, you go from 25 centimeters to about 2.5 centimeters, so that's a reduction of 10. That means that this reduction of 10 is translated in a length increase of 10. Mm -hmm. So you go from 10 meters to 100 meters. Mm -hmm. so, that, so the bar is you know, typically uh, a few centimeters thick and 100 meter long, okay? The strip, the strip is what happens when uh, the bar has, been, has passed through the finisher and it's now thin enough so you can wrap it. Hmm? Coil is uh, a coiled, uh, a wrapped uh, piece of strip, yes. VSB is a vertical scale breaker. Hmm? It's a, uh, it does two things. It breaks the scale on the side of your uh, slab. Yes, but it also reduces the width of your slab. So it's, the rolls are vertical, not horizontal. Okay, so that's vertical, and we call them scale breaks, although they do two things. They break the scale, and scale is oxide. Yeah? Um, etcher is a smaller um, roll that makes sure you've, you, uh, the width, uh, you may get some uh, bulging at the edge, yes? is uh, controlled. Yeah. The roughers are usually, in the technical literature, you write R, R1, R2, R3, yes? That's the way we design roughing mills. And um, the finishers are usually referred to F1, F2, F3, F4, F7, yes? Uh, designation of finishing. And when we talk about descaling, yes? We talk about removing of scale, and scale is oxide. And uh, the, so the thermal oxide that is formed on the strip during processing. It's at high temperature, it's in air, it's iron, so it readily oxidizes. So that's, that's also an issue that needs to be taken care of. And that's, so descaling is usually done with high pressure water. Okay, right, and this is just, um, sometimes you have foreigners that use other uh, dimensions and it's nice to have some conversion table. So, um, okay, so let's start at some uh, configur general configuration. So this, let's, let, there's a configuration one here, which is very traditional. So you have a reheating, reheating furnaces, typically two to three. Again, depends on your production yeah, capacity. Uh, so your slabs are fed into this furnace. Then you descale the uh, the slab as they come out of the furnace. Then you do uh, you have a sizing edger, determines the width of your uh, slab. You go through roughing mills, yes, which do a first reduction. Yes, so you go again from 25 centimeters to 25 millimeters. Yes, transfer bar. Is what you have here. Yes, you de you shear, shearing. Uh, we'll see that the uh, front end of the 
uh, bar and the tail end of the bar are not straight. Yes, They're, they they can have shapes. They can be rounded. They can have the shape of a fish tail. You have to cut this off. Yes, and so you 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 cut the material here, hmm? and then you pass through the the tender mill, the finisher mill, the cooling table, which we we call the run out table yeah? because the the strip is really running at high speed out of the uh, the finishing mill, and then you coil. Yeah? And you can have two, one, two, or three coilers, depending on um, your production capacity and depending on your investments capacity, because coilers are very expensive. Okay. Right. Uh, just um, an interesting thing you may want to remember. Um, if you are involved in research in your career, if you need material uh, from a steel plant, it's always very hard to get materials. In particular, you, know, you want samples. Yes, it's very hard to get samples from from um, from coiled material. Yes, uh, because they have to do, they have to go and cut it. Yes. However, you should always remember that you can easily get samples after shears. Yes, and very often there are places in the plants where people shear the strip. Yes, and they don't have to make any special effort to uh, to get to cut it. Yes, you, the only effort you have to make is get the sample. Yes, right, uh, and that's more easily organized and it costs much less. Yeah? So if you need samples from uh, the hot mill, typical sample, um, it, get them after the shear. Yes. Certainly, if you want laboratory samples, right? And there's plenty. Every 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 um, uh, slab, yes, is you cut the front end and the tail end of the slab, so you can get samples there. Right. Okay. Um, right. So this is uh, uh, a more detailed thing. Yes. Uh, these here. Um, Oh yeah, this, why, why did I have this? Uh, because in this case, you get a better idea of the actual dimensions. Because here it looks like the finishing mill is very wide and, and there's very little distance between uh, the, the, she, the roughing mill and the finishing mill. Actually, you need a lot of distance between the, um, uh, the finisher the, the rougher and the finisher. The reason why is because you have a bar, a bar that's 100 meter long, right? So that's why this distance here is 120 meters long. Yeah? On the other hand, the finisher is actually quite compact. You know, 30, 40 meters, that's enough. Yeah? And again, the laminar cooling will be long. The laminar cooling will be long. It will typically be... Um, well, it's, it's, it's not this uh, fully uh, 180 meters. It'll be about 100 meters, yes? Uh, and the reason why is because you want to control very precisely the, um, the cooling uh, path of your material. Okay, I see that it's a quarter past uh, 12, and um, so we've come to the end of the session today. And I thank you for your attention. We'll continue.